without further ado, Suzanne, I'm going to share the screen. Perfect. And Thank you for being the technical tonight. Appreciate oh. that. Okay, can you see it? Does everybody yeah. see yep. it? Okay, yeah. wonderful. Yay. Yay. Well, my pleasure. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I know people have asked why Southwest Pottery. Well, the Crocker actually has a fantastic collection of ceramics. They have probably one, some of the best in the United States. They have more, almost 6,000 ceramic pieces. And part of that collection is Southwest Pottery. And I became quite enamored with it uh, a couple of years ago. And I just wanted to share some of the pieces that I have seen and what I have, what I have learned. So I want to start by just saying that American Indians of the Southwest began making pottery at least 2,000 years ago. And they passed their skills from generation to generation and almost always from grandmother or mother to aunt to daughter to niece or other female family members. It was a matriarchal skill. So today we're going to focus, I want to focus on three legendary matriarchs who raised pottery making to an artistic level and established do uh, dozens of descendants who follow in their footsteps. Um, the Native American views that all things living or inanimate possess a spirit uh, and that kind of drives this language of symbols that we see on these pots. And I, I want to emphasize that all these artists considered and those today that are still working in the traditional way, they, they still consider that these pots are living, that they have a spirit, that they are breathing as well. And there's a deep emotional and spiritual investment in the land and connection to the land. Um, in the world of Native American art, as in other cultures, symbols are passed from generation to generation. And all the symbols that we see are going to be associated with the simplicity or the struggle of everyday life, spirituality, or a combination of both. And most of the symbols uh, of the normal life that we'll see are related to rain and water, snow, foodstuffs, animals, both domestic and wild. And spiritually, symbols typically address the birth, the healing, the life, death, life balance, and the afterlifes. And the potters use these symbols that had meaning to them and that were personal. And many of the artists adapted them in their own style. So before we start looking at these pots, I, I want to do a really quick overview of how these pots are made in the traditional way. Claudia, you want to give me the first slide, please? There we go. All right. Just briefly, the clay is chosen. Um, it's usually indigenous to the Pueblo or the area that the um, artist lives. It is a very arduous process of making these pots. They dig the clay, they dry it, and then they soak it again, and then they dry it again, and then they pulverize it, and then they soak it again. And then they mix the clay with water, and then they screen it and dry it again. And then they, they mix the clay uh, that... Um, that's been screened with, with screen sand. And they do it, another interesting thing, they put either ash in it, or they, in a very most honored and revered way, the old pottery remains are ground down and combined with the clay. So I know we have a potter or two online, uh, you know, watching tonight, and that re those remains act as a temper or grout, and they aid in preventing that newly formed pot from shrinking or cracking during the, the drying process. And in addition, the old pottery, rem pottery remnants present an essential spiritual correlation to the past. So if you look at the uh, top right, all the pottery, um, oh, I think, uh, Claudia, you may have put up the old one and not the new one, but that's okay. We'll, we'll get through this one. Uh, it starts as a ball of clay, and then it, it forms the base uh, from the ball of clay, and they make it in a cup. So it's all hand done. Then every pot that you are going to see tonight, or every piece of pottery, is made by rolling coils. And that, Claudia, you want to go to the next slide, please? 
So, well, yeah, this was I this was the old one, but that's okay. It starts with the ball. They put the little cup and then they start attaching the first coil. And then every coil is attached and the clay is thinned and moved and shaped. And the these ropes of clay, they shape and work the ropes, the coils upward using their hands or scrapers or rocks or bones. And so I want you to keep this in mind, this traditional method as we view the pottery, noting how beautifully skilled these potters were and are. They do not use a potter's wheel like many do. These are all handmade and it's a traditional, it goes back several thousand years. So you can see in the far, the bottom right, that's kind of the, the, pot, the pot complete and it's left to dry and then it's sanded and leveled and scraped again to take out any uh, air bubbles. It is an art, as I said, an arduous process. Some pots can take six months to a year to make with the, the, the constant uh, work that has to be done on them. So they are labors of love. All right, so let's go to the, the next slide. All right, so those, the names of the potters have been lost to history. You know, some of, some of them, I, I do want to focus on three of today's best known ceramic families. And that's, um, that's in Nampeo, which is a Hopi Tewa. And you can see that the Hopi Tewa of Pueblo is in the northeast corner of Arizona. Uh, it taps onto the Navajo, near the Navajo Nation. The Tofoya family from the Santa Clara Pueblo, which is, um, if you can see where that is, it's just north, northwest of Santa Fe. And then the San Ildefonso, which is slightly south and also close to Santa Fe. And that is the Martinez family. Um, they're from the Pueblos or the permanent villages. There are also two others I want to just touch on, and that's the Acoma Pueblo. And you can see where that is. It's quite south, uh, southwest uh, of Albuquerque. And then the Cochiti Pueblo. Thank you, Claudia. The Cochiti Pueblo, which is just north, just directly uh, west of Santa Fe. Uh, but we are going to focus most of our time on the first three of the Pueblo dynasties. Okay, so before we move here, I want to talk a little, let's start with um, Nampeo, who was a Hopi Tewa, um, and she was born in the Hano Pueblo. Now the Pueblos are collect, whoops, go, go back, please. Go, there you go, go, no, back. <laughs> no, back. <laughs> there we go, yeah, we'll stay with the map just for right now. Um, uh, is um, as I mentioned, is located on the eastern part of the of the Hopi Reservation in northeastern uh, Arizona. In the 1680s, there was a revolt by the Pueblos and its inhabitants to kick the Spanish out. Because remember, the Spanish came up and they took over everything uh, in the in what we call the Southwest area of Mexico. Uh, the Tewa, that's uh, clan or tribes, band together. And to fight them, to kick them out. And not surprising, they lost and they started fleeing. So some stayed in New Mexico and stayed at the existing pueblos that they have. And then some went east to the Hopi lands and settled and they and they settled into the Hope the Hopi lands. And the Hopis um, were peaceful people. And the Tewas were a little warlike, and they thought, well, that's probably a pretty good combination that we got the peaceful people and the ones that are going to protect us. So they took them in. Um, and they were, um, um, that when I talk, sometimes I'll talk about, I'll mention it, the first Mesa or the second Mesa or the third Mesa. And that is pretty typical for the Hopi designations. And the, the Mesas are a group of villages. So when I say the first Mesa, it's a group of villagers. And those were mostly noted as potters. When I say the second Mesa, it's the group of villages. And they were known as carvers, the Kachina dolls. There were some weavers and textiles. And then the third mesa were the silver workers. And there also there were a few weavers. So now we can go to the next slide, Claudia. Light off. Oh, I like that. Okay. Ooh, it's beautiful. Okay, so this is Nampeo. 
Nampeo, as I said, was the, one of the most illustrious line of the Hopi Tewa potters. And she was born in the first Mesa of the Hano village, which is one of the villages of the Hopi Tewa Pueblo. Um, and uh, she was taught pottery by her grandmother, who was Hopi, and her mother, who was Tewa. And she was incredibly skilled. So let's, I want to pick up our story in the 1870s, that the railroad had opened up the West, and it was changing the life of the American Indian. Among many things that the railroads brought were cheap aluminum cookware. And for thousands of years, the Hopi women had been making their pots, and most of the pots were utilitarian, that they use them for cooking or carrying water. And there were some that were also decorated, used for very special occasions very, or ceremonies. Um, so when the railroads began to bring this cheap aluminum, the pot makers pretty much stopped making their cookware pots. They said, why bother? We don't have to haul the, these, these pots with water. We don't have to put them in for cooking. We use these, these aluminum pots. And so the art of pot making was kind of on the verge of vanishing. Enter Nempeo. Now, Nampeo was a very shrewd businesswoman, and she realized that not only did the railroads bring aluminum pots and other of Sikyaki, Sikyaki, and they were being excavated. So as her husband was working on these, he was bringing shards to her uh, of, of, from the excavated runes, and they had little, they had designs on them. So she first started just copying the design and, and putting them into her own pottery. This one, such as the moth pot, is, is absolutely a gorgeous example of some of that ancient symbols. Now the moth is like the butterfly. It represents rebirth, change, transformation. However, the, the moth is also a nocturnal animal. So it's a little more mysterious and enigmatic. Um, let's go to the next one, Claudia. Next slide. There we, there we go. Now, Nampeo started developing her own style based on traditional designs. And the traditional Sityaki design is the one you see on the, on the far right, the top right. It has a, what they call a shoulder pot, or some people call it a flying saucer pot. But it is extremely difficult to do. And I know, Patricia, you're a potter. And the reason it's extremely difficult to do, because as you build up the bottom of the pot, you have to dry it in sequences as you start building the pot inward or else the clay will collapse it. So pots like these took a long time. You had to work on it, it dried. You worked on it, you dried. And it was very, very carefully crafted. So she began experimenting with, with these designs that she, they, they pulled from the excavation. And then she began experimenting also with the thickness of the pot, making them much lighter and more delicate than the traditional Hopi pots. She taught others in her village the technique, and she was so successful at it, they started calling, they started calling it the Sityaki or the Hopi revival. And you can see these beautiful wares on hers or on the left. And some of the pots that she did, she, some were quite large, some were quite small. Um, and all of her designs have this kind of architectural look. They have a very old look, and a lot of that has to do with the clay that was dug and the way they were fired. Um, Nampeo, as other pot potters of that time, did not sign their pieces at all, and it, and because the practice was traditionally viewed as, as it was giving too much attention to an individual rather than the community. And these Pueblos were very community-based. Um, so Nampeo was, was painting, and she painted using natural slips or watered-down um, dyes, uh, watered-down, excuse me, clays, 
using any natural dye or pigments, earth pigments. And those were done and then they were, fi they were fired. Um, she said when she first began to paint, she used to go to the ancient village and pick up pieces of pottery and copy the designs. And she said, that's how I learned to paint, but now I just close my eyes and I see designs and I paint them. So she also did something very interesting, which is very traditional, is that she used sheep bones in the fire to make the fire hotter, which is very traditional. All right, let's, uh, let's look up to next slide, Claudia. What she was famous for was the migration pattern. As you can see her on one of her pots. And that is, you can see the um, curving feathers moving in one direction. And this was the migration of the Tewa people. Um, it was the signifying the moving of people to new villages to find new sources of food. The interesting thing about the Hopis is that their migration stories are the histories of the Hopi clans. So according to Hopi traditionals, the clans migrated independently north to Arizona from the south, and that was South and Central America and Mexico. And they arrived at the Hopi homelands at different times. And the clan names, such as the clan bear, the bear clan or the snake clan often reflects an episode in the clan's migration. So each clan has their own stories about the migration across the Southwest and their arrival at the present villages. Um, they all seem to relate to a great flood or other ancient events. And the interesting thing is that the Hopis are considered one of the oldest living cultures in documented history. So Nampeo had three daughters, Annie, Nellie, and Fanny, who were also skilled potters. And they decorated and fired Nampeo's pots when she began to lose her eyesight. And then the daughters, in turn, passed their skills on to their children. What mattered most to Nampeo and, and other Pueblo potters was maintaining the tradition of making the pots, not the pots themselves. Can I have the next slide? So I want to show a little bit of the next, next couple of generations. There we go. This is uh, a, sh a shred. Um, it's not a shred pot, it's shard. It's a shard pot. <laughs> shard part by Nampeo's great granddaughter, Dextra Nampeo. It's very large and elaborate, and it's, uh, it's decorated with depictions of the pottery shards that were taken out from Sikkatyi. So it's, it's an incredibly detailed, detailed pot, and all done using the very old methods. Nothing was painted on or, or with, with um, uh, glazes or anything. It was all painted on using the natural pigments and the slips. All right, should we go to the next slide, Claudia? Thank you. This Ooh. one yeah. wow. is by another Hopi artist, a uh, modern artist, Al Koyama. And he kind of pushes the boundaries of pot making. He makes these flawless surfaces on the outside and then these reliefs of these, of usually tiny villages, although this is a, is a nice sized pot. Um, remember, this is all coil. This is all done with a co these coils. So when he's finished the pot, he pushes in a section. And then where you see the kiva, which is that tower, and then the wall. Thank you, Claudia. And then there, there you go. That's all pushed out from the inside of the pot. Ooh. And then decorated from the outside, with the exception of the wall that comes, there you go, that wall right there, which is added. And then like this, this pot is fired. And mm -hmm. it's fired in the old traditional method, which is um, usually a hole with wood or um, some kind of stand where the pot is and then the wood surrounds it and it burns down around it. All right. So... Now that we've done with this, I want to go to the Santa Clara Pueblo and talk about that this deeply carved pottery is primarily associated with the, the, the Santa Clara Pueblo, as are these black pots. So let me start with the maker, matriarch, who was Serafina Tafoya. And she was the mother and the leading potter of the Santa Clara Pueblo, and she was a master at making fine polished blackware. 
And if you look at this closely, um, it's a bear claw symbol. And that's very personal to their family and very indicative of Serafina and her three daughters, Margaret, Christina, and Camilo. Um, the bear to the Pueblo peoples are considered, is considered one of the six directional guardians. And of course, considered strong leadership, but it's also revered, interestingly, as a finder of water. And for the Tafoya family, they use this claw motif as their personal symbol of water. So you'll see these beautiful black pots that are known from the Santa Clara. And you, uh, many of them um, have this paw print on it. So now I want to focus a little bit on the black pots. I want to focus on the color and I want to focus on the glaze. How do you think they are produced? Anybody have an idea? Just, you just start. The, color? the colors the, again? The color, the color black. How do you think they get the color black? Charcoal? That's a, that, that, that yeah. Okay, so charcoal, what, like, and what about the glaze? Oh. So let's go to the next, let's go to the next slide, Claudia. All right, the same, this is her, this is her daughter, Margaret. Margaret was best known as, as um, her, all, her Pueblo name was also Corn Blossom. And she perfected this black fired stamping impressions on pots, these deep, deep carvings. That's what the Santa Clara Pueblo is known for is carving the, she shared, again, she, Margaret shared her skills with her children, and she saw, she actually taught a dynasty of potters. Um, so the black pot. All right, let's go to the next slide, and we'll see how they're done. All right. First, you can see that the pot, just the, it is the regular color that they, of, of the clay. It's incised, or it's cut out. This particular pot is cut out with this design. They're, they wash and they're sanded, and then they put on a clay slip, which as I said, a, a, water, a watery clay, which can be plain or mixed with a natural pigment. And then they are burnished or polished. Mm -hmm. the, the pots are not painted, and the, it is not a gloss or a glaze, but it's using a rock, or a piece of wood and you rub it and you rub it to the point where it becomes glossy. And then the pot, as you can see on the top right, is placed, this one is actually a metal milk carton carrier, milk, you know, those milk carton things that they have. The pot is inside and they stack the wood around it and then light it fire and then it burns and fires it. So at this certain moment, the right moment, sheep or horse manure is shoveled over the flames. And what it does is cut off the oxygen and it creates this black finish. So that's where you get these go gorgeous black pots. They're taken out, washed, and they're washed very gently, just with a little water, and then set out to dry. I want to so, know thought of that. <laughs> I, it probably was some kind of accident that they were using <laughs> sheep dung or horse dung for something in the fire and they probably it was probably an accident it was probably an accident but the Santa Clara uh, Pueblo perfected it and then passed on some of those skills to the next Pueblo that we're going to see after we talk a little bit more but they were very generous in teaching their skills most of these taught their skills to any person who was interested in learning and as I said it was was a matriarch, so it was woman to woman to woman. So let's uh, go to the next slide, Claudia. Oh, All right. I'll wait till it's, I'll wait till it's over. Now this one um, is Christina. This is Margaret's sister. She's is Nampeo's daughter. She was a master at the family's deep carving. And however, she used this red slip, uh, which is very unusual, and it's no longer... Uh, available. It was from the source near the Santa Clara Pueblo and it's no longer uh, available. But again, you can see where she used the mat slip around and then the, the 
the red slip and then polished all the areas that she wanted to look like it was gloss. And then the pot was fired and it came out, it comes out like that. This one, this one was one that did not, they did not put the dung on it to cut it over. It was the red because it was the natural color an unusual color that they wanted to keep. So anyone want to take a crack at the animal on the pot? What, what do you think it is? Snake. Snake. Exactly. Snake. Who said that? Lynn? I did. Okay. It is a snake. <laughs> it's a water snake. It's called the Avanyu. It's the guardian of water. The water snake, a very spiritual animal. He's revered by many people of the Southwest tribes and appears frequently in many, many designs. You'll see this, this Avanyu all over designs. And no surprise, a lot of the symbols relate to water because they're in an arid climate and water is very precious. Um, the special thing about the Avanyu is that the Avanyu saved the people coming down from the clouds with the lightning bolt. They killed the evil drought and it brought the rain. But the question becomes is why a snake? Why, why would they think of a snake as related to water? And why well, would the snake have teeth? And well, it's a, it, it's a spiritual animal. It's a it's a water serpent. It's a, dra <laughs> it's a dragon. Dragon. <laughs> They're cultural dragon. But but why a snake? Period. And if you think about how a snake slithers on the on the dirt, it's kind of like this. Mm -hmm. It's like a water channel. It's like oh. a river. It's like how the water goes. It never goes in a straight line. It's always moving like that. So, um, you know, what the does the arrow mean? The ar the arrows are interesting. That's the lightning bolt coming down oh, from his mouth. Oh. So you'll see, usually you'll see Alvanyu's always with a lightning bolt, which is power. Um, uh -huh. Okay. Let's look at the, this is uh, absolutely, a, I, you know, this one was one that was in, a, in an exhibit and it is absolutely right. stunning. So now mm -hmm. I want to just talk about, there are dozens of Tafoya family descendants. The one on the left is Nathan Youngblood, who is a descendant of Margaret uh, Tafoya. And I know you're all thinking what that piece looks like in Fabergé egg, and that yeah. was his inspiration. <laughs> Now, remember, he did this exactly using the traditional methods. He, he built it the same. He carved it out as a Santa Clara tradition, and he fired it in the traditional way. So that's where he get, you get the black piece. But the, the symbols on it are his stylized symbols. And he says he has one foot in, in tradition and one foot in modern. And uh, he was actually came and gave a lecture and he talked about his great, his grandmother, I think it was his, either his great grandmother or his grandmother. And he said she built pots. And remember, this is from the Santa Clara. She built pots big enough for him, for her to stand in. They were so, so large. So uh, the one on the left, also uh, uh, a, um, a modern day uh, pot. And what's lovely about this one is that the uh, artist is using micaceous earth, or my, which is uh, clay that has a lot of mica in it. So um, mm. the, it, it, the, the, um, the shine, the sparkle is all from that mica that is put into, that is part of that clay. Now, when they were doing these pots um, many years ago, Nobody wanted to use the micacia because they felt it was flawed. Nobody wanted to see the mic on it. They wanted a very smooth, uh, matte finish. And what he also does is add um, an inset of, uh, of silver to, uh, to the pot. This is an absolutely wow. stunning piece. So the interesting Beautiful. thing is he is Hopi and Santa Clara. So he is combining both of his, the skills that he learned uh, in pottery making and silver making. Okay, let's go to the next, the next Pueblo. Whoops, or that one, that one works. <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Okay, here's our, here's the San Ildefonso Pueblo. Now from, um, 
uh, from a pueblo. It's north of Santa Fe. The San Ildefonso potters are celebrated for their elegant black on black pottery. Um, and uh, Maria Montoya Martinez, uh, who's the woman on the right, she is the matriarch. She's also Tewa and uh, in the San Ildefonso uh, Pueblo. And she popularized the black ware. But she, her earlier pieces were like the one on the left, which were polychromes. And her husband, Julian, was her partner in that she would make the, um, the pots, she would produce the pots and he would decorate many of them. Um, and he would also dig the clay. So they, they were partners. And the interesting thing is that um, Maria was the first potter to sign her work. As I mentioned before, the potters up until then would not sign their work. But beginning in 1923, um, the, well, actually in the 20s and 30s, the world was going crazy for the Art Deco style. And galleries started showing her pots, but they insisted that she sign them to be authentic. So that's when she started signing and then the others followed suit and started signing their, their pots too. Again, also the world was changing and men began making pots. Up until then, they really didn't, uh, but they approached it as a career. They realized they could, they could be sold in money and they could, they could get you know, sold in galleries and they can get money for them. So they were not taking care of the families and running the households, so they could, they could make pots. Whereas the women made pots and ran the families and the household, raised the families. So, um, and if you can look at some of the pots, you can see, if you look at the pot she's holding, the Avanyu, right, right above it, oh. you know, on, the, on, the, on the top part of the, of the one she's holding. And you can see those little circle dips, those little half circles. Those are usually symbols of clouds, again, rain. So a lot of the symbols and then the stylized symbols go to rain. Okay, let's go to the next. And this one, polychrome, meaning many colors, uh, made, hand-painted. Julian probably painted this one. Um, and it is, it is a lovely, very lovely, simple piece with just some gorgeously elaborate symbols on it. All right, let's go to the next, the next one, Claudia, please. There we go. Mm. So, beautiful. Maria became very famous for her thin, graceful pots, black pots, black on black, they call this. And she was really fast. But how she learned this technique was from Serafina Tafoya from the Santa Clara Pueblo. And uh, they, uh, Serafina showed Maria how to make the black pots. And then a, Maria adopted this shiny matte style left, you know, bo on both pots as her own. And then she refined it. So if you think about her making this pot, it's in this, it's in the adobe color and all those glossy pieces has taken a stone or a piece of wood and they've been buffed and they buff back and forth, back and forth until you get that shininess. But look how detailed and beautiful it is. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, it is. Um, the, some of the symbols on here, you can see the Kiva steps. Those are the things that look like steps going down. It's to a Kiva. And whoops. Oh, Suzanne. Nope. Yep. Suzanne. Go, go back, Claudia. So, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Who is that, Janice? Uh, no, it's Lynn. Lynn. Um, so the matte portions did not get buffed, correct? That's, that's correct. It was so just, those little teeny tiny lines had to be buffed. Yes. The shiny lines. Yes. In the designs. Yes. That's amazing. It is. It's spectacular. That's how skilled these women were. And um, the Kiva, as I was mentioning, kind of represents uh, man's journey from the underworld to the upper world. And it usually represents birth, life, and death. And it's a very sacred part of their life, the, the, the kiva. Um, and then you'll also see the checkerboard in the center. Uh, I've been told that that can reflect um, the, um, the crops, the, the fields of crops. Uh, Maria may have had something else in mind on that. The pot to the right, where it looks like knives, 
uh, is actually, uh, it's a wing, uh, eagle wing feather pot, and those are eagle feathers. And the eagle is a very powerful symbol also used. It's a, the eagles have the power to take the prayer from the natural world to the supernatural. And so when every time you, that's why feathers are so revered and the eagle is so revered. And um, uh, it is a very special symbol that's used. Okay, let's look at the, some of her ancestors and uh, uh, not ancestors, descendants. Here we go. We have um, the pot on the left, um, which is Dora Sepe. Uh, and uh, she is San Ildefonso and Zia, which is another Pueblo. Um, and what she did is combine uh, different techniques. Uh, she's, uh, uh, she married into this, she married into the San Ildefonso and uh, uh, she married her teacher's son. He was also a potter. And uh, she's known for her black and brown effects and inset turquoise or uh, coral decoration. Uh, she originally learned pottery from her mom and then went to the San Ildefonso uh, Pueblo and learned under some um, mas masters. Now, what do you see again on this pot? It's our friend. It's our friend, the Avanyu. And, and the Avanyu's eye is the turquoise. Huh. Remember that a lot of it's stylized. This is, this is a, a newer version of it. The pot on the left was done by Mar Martha Appleleaf. She was the great niece of Maria Montoya um, Martinez. And this subtle green, um, really sets her pots apart. This subtle green slip that she used, um, it was really a happy accident. It was a mistake and they were, she was gonna throw the pot away and someone said, that is fantastic. Whoops. So she, whoop, whoop. Her finger. <laughs> okay, Claudia, there we go. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, she started becoming known for that. And again, if you look at the design, it includes the Kiva steps, the triangle, mm. feathers, bear claw, the scallops mm. for rain. So all these are done in their own stylized way, but, it, but keeping with the, her um, uh, great aunt's uh, eagle feather design that was specifically uh, Maria's and she incorporated that in. Okay, let's go to the next Pueblo, which is the Acoma. And located on the yeah. southwest part, uh, southwest of Albuquerque, the Acoma Pueblo actually sits on top of a mesa and it's called Sky City. Uh, the Acoma people have been living in Sky City for about a thousand years and the Acoma pottery is known for its fine line work and detail. These incredible fine lines <laughs> together, you can see them usually signifying rain falling from the sky or water. And the Acoma are known for their designs done in black and orange on matte with a white slip. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, th these pots are spectacular. They're incredibly thin and they're, and they're actually quite delicate. Again, made with coiled ropes, the coil, the coil method. Mm -hmm. um, these three pots here represent three generations of um, Marie Chino. She was one of the matriarchs of the uh, Akama pottery makers. There's a couple of others with Akama, but Marie is also probably one of the better known ones. And the <clears throat> Marie's pot on the left, her um, daughter's um, her daughter's pot is in the center. That's Carrie. It's an Ola. You see an Ola or Oya, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It's a water jug. Or anytime you see Oya, it's a, used as a water jug. And then um, her granddaughter, Joanne, on the far right. And that um, um, kind of makes that three family. And the, what is so spectacular about these is that these were all hand-drawn. They're not you. They didn't use stencils. They didn't use, uh, they may have used uh, twine or something or something natural to mark the sections. But as you see how it, moves from very uh, 
dents in the bottom to up and then the perspective changes as your eye moves towards the top all yeah, that was hand done and it, this is um the one on the left particularly uh is a really well-known design in quilting as well it's called the uh, orange peel uh-huh and, uh, and, and it's a very old pattern so that's that's really interesting it is beautiful in the in the akama this is a called a snowflake pattern again water so the, the, you can see that they, they adapted a lot of different designs and that's interesting i'd love to see a quilt like this catherine yeah okay so gorgeous absolutely gorgeous pot some of these are quite large and what i want you to do is notice the tops the, the the openings at the top how closed in they are remember how they had to work they have to work from the inside the inside out and upward as they're as they're smoothing and moving some of these pots they're called seed pots and the opening is just big enough for a seed to go in that's oh. how that's that's how good they are and they use those pots they didn't decorate them like this but they use those seed pots for for seeds to protect the seeds from the rodents and then they would smash the pots to get the the seed oh. to plant at planting time but remember they weren't they weren't decorated they were utilitarian okay our last pueblo that we're going to today is the cochiti whoop or or we're back at the beginning <laughs> or not you know, okay claudia it's really hard to get good help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what you pay them, honest yeah. to God. You'd think it'd be better. All right. Story yeah, there we go. This is the Cochiti. Yeah. We moved directly west of Santa Fe is the Cochiti Pueblo. And one of the most exceptional visual depictions of culture, of the Native uh, uh, American culture, is the storyteller doll. Oh. And and they're called sometimes called Pueblo storytellers. And uh, they, the, the storyteller or the Pueblo storyteller doll has distinctive features that include an open mouth figure surrounded by children, animals or both, and, 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 and that listen to stories. And the storyteller can be male or female, a clown or any kind of animal. And there's always at least one listener, but there can be as many as the artist desires. I've seen them with two or three dozen little figures hanging on them. Um, listening children always, you know, often encircle the storyteller or climb on its back. And um, an, an open mouth is either painted or sculpted on the storyteller so that the storyteller can tell their stories. And sometimes the mouths are open on the, on the listeners as well. Uh, the figures sometimes hold important Pueblo objects such as drums or pottery or rugs or other meaningful artifacts. This um, artist, Helen Cordero, was the first person to start doing uh, storyteller figures. And she was a Cochiti uh, potter from the Cochiti Pueblo in New Mexico. Uh, and then she grew frustrated with making typical forms of the Native American pottery she was taught. So she started out by sculpting singing mother figures with their open mouths and children in their arms. And then this design and style, and she started this in 1964. So the motif soon evolved to, to the first storyteller doll. And she was inspired by her grandfather, who was a tribal storyteller. Uh, and she substituted him for the singing mother. Or she substituted yeah, for the, put the singing mother in, in place of the grandfather because she wanted to honor him and the stories she grew up hearing from him, and which is the Pueblo storytelling tradition and and thus the american the native american storyteller doll was born and this is a gorgeous little piece it's fun it's just fun yeah. it makes you smile but it's also a beautiful piece of art knowing that it was done in a traditional manner too and lillian you have a little storyteller don't you <laughs> yes i do i you do wanna, you want to hold it up well, how do I get on? Are, are, can you see me out here? Let's see, what see do I need to do? Well, we can see half of your face. You got to put it actually in front of the camera. Oh. No, you got to move it to your left. Lil. To your left. <laughs> Lil, Lil. To your left. It's moving. Left. Move to your left. Left, 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 left. Okay, there you go. There's her little storyteller. She's got two, uh, so two little, she has uh, twins. 
And then if you move it down a little bit, you can see the open mouth of the storyteller and the open mouth of the twin. Oh, cute. Yeah, there we go. So anyway, I, I think we're at our last slide, Claudia. <clears throat> I think I went way over a half hour. Sorry, again. <laughs> As you can see, we get a little carried away from this. It was fascinating. So interesting. Yeah. And oh, do yes. you have any comments or questions? I mean, we could spend an hour easily on each of those matriarchs. How, how much of these would be on display at any given time? Oh, you know, that's a good question. Um, the show that a lot of these were from were from Borrowed Pieces, but the Crocker does have a, a lovely selection. And they only put maybe maybe a dozen pieces out at once. I mean, they have a huge ceramic area. So there's probably um, two or 300 ceramic pieces out at any one time. Um, as I said, they had almost 6,000 ceramics that was started oh. by one of the Crocker daughters. She started wow. collecting Korean uh, pottery mm -hmm. and, um, or art, uh, art pieces, ceramics and, uh, um, it was, uh, and you know, I interchange ceramics, pottery. Ceramics is kind of like the umbrella. And then there's the, um, there's stone, there's earthware, which is what all the pieces that we saw tonight were. That was the clay from the earth. There's stoneware, and then there's porcelain, all, all mm. using different types of clay, fired differently and prepared differently. And porcelain, people think it's very delicate, but surprisingly, it's a very, very hardy, hardy piece. You know, the porcelains like you see, like Meissen or um, Limoges, that, those type of porcelain pieces. Um, so yeah, they have a beautiful collection, but I, since they've been closed almost a year, I don't know what they've uh, redone with their, their pieces. Um, and uh, they had quite a bit out for a while. And then they've put a lot, the last I checked that they put a lot away. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> They're beautiful. That's such a such an interesting topic. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it was one that I would normally do. Hi, hey, Patricia. Can I can I show something really quick? Show and tell. Sure. Okay, this is one of the pieces that I did. This is a um, one of the stones where you take it and you rub it and you rub it. it took hours and hours and hours to do this. I gave up. I had somebody else work on it. They gave up. It took forever. And can you see how it's not glossy at all? It is glossy. It you can see the reflection, not, a little bit not, of the reflection. Not yeah. like what you got on them. I mean, they spent, those pieces that you showed had to be hours and hours and like probably days mm. yeah. worth of work. Some of so this, this is a dung firing. It's called Raku. Raku this is another yeah. dung firing. We use cow and uh, horse manure. Mm -hmm. And so this one, if I don't know how well you can see the, the colors on it, but it, it gets oranges and pinks. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. we can see it. It's very, it's yeah. Very Does that have to do with how close you are, where the heat was and, and uh, it's, the different It's colors? all a fluke. It just depends. This one, <laughs> wherever the black was is where the dung was. And you sit it in and mm -hmm. the colors come from the um, fumes of the dung as it's firing off. Yeah. So... Hmm. Um, it's, they're, they're really this color is they're beautiful the the coloring it's very pinks um kind of like a maroons but this is a dung firing also and you get different colors depending on the manure wow. Wow. Nice. really nice that's beautiful Patricia. but you are absolutely yeah. right these pots can take a year up to a year or more hours spent it's very meticulous and very uh, and you can, it just, I was in awe on how they made them. I mean, I thought they all had pottery wheels and they don't. They're all done by roll, rolling clay. Rolling and I don't know how she was able to get those fine lines like Lynn said. I mean, the, the, she had to be so accurate and precise mm -hmm. that's on what that. She, that's for, what she was known. That's why her pots are so, uh, uh, well, the, she's so well known as a potter, and that's why they're very revered, and they're they're mm -hmm. expensive. You know, if you, oh, if yeah. you can find them, you can. They they can be very expensive, and uh, um, 
but the, remember they they use different things. And my understanding was that um, Nathan Youngblood, who did come and speak to the Crocker, said that the implements that they use are handed down from generation to generation, but especially like the stones mm -hmm. or things. But and there's certain kinds of stones you have to go and you have to find. But he said he could never use any of his grandmother's. Uh, tools because they were too small for his hands. Her, her oh. hands were tiny. So, hmm. uh, you know, so I, I am process. Just, but, you know, is it burnished first and then fired or fired first and then burnished? Burnished first and then fired. The fire is the last, the last stop, the last step yes. in washing. And of uh, course, can I, can I just say one more thing real quick? Course. I'm sorry, Suzanne. Here's so, a <laughs> you're so, a potter I'm not <laughs> so while you're while you're burnishing this and it has not been fired it's very breakable mm -hmm. so you could be spending days and days on it and just hit it wrong and break the whole thing you're absolutely it's not right. fired yep you're yeah. absolutely right and then you don't know when you fire it if it's going to come out or not because when you're doing fire like they do, they're they, they're not in a kiln that's that's controlled heat. Yeah, you're you're putting uh, wood on on something, and they're so good at doing this. But Nathan said that right. you probably lose about half your pieces because uh. as you're you got to think as you're burnishing it, and you put you have to put pressure to burnish, right? right? So what you can do is you can get cracks that you don't even know that you're putting on the piece. So you can crack it and not know there's a crack there that will not show up until you fire it. Yeah. And then the wow. piece will just break in the kiln. Yeah. So, and yeah, one of it's, it's, it's phenomenal it's, what they've done. It is. And one of the steps that we didn't show on there, but does take time is that after it's dried, after it's dried, blah, 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 they go back and they use, um, they try to take out all the bubbles in the clay. They said anytime there's an air bubble or air pocket, that will explode it. So they have to go back through with a, a some kind of a stick or something that they use and they manipulate to take any air bubbles out, which is also time consuming. Just mm -hmm. amazing so, you know, stuff. Patricia, did you use a, um, a pottery wheel to make yours or did you do a coil? Like no, mine's all, no, coil, that takes forever. I'm not one of those people that take this, like, get it done, you know? <laughs> No, mine was all on wheel. Uh huh. Well, that's still impressive wheel. because a lot of people use greenware, which is already poured yeah. in, in, a, in, a, yeah. in a mold and it's already done for you. Like I do when I go to color me mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ralph would like to ask a question. Can oh, Ralph ask a question. Was Ralph here? Hey, Ralph. Hi, Ralph. Hey. Hey, Ralph. You said earlier yeah. that, um, I don't know if it was when the gentleman came to speak at, the Crocker that uh, over time men started realizing men started realizing oh, they could do this because they didn't have to take care of the family or the uh -huh. children and so um, all of a sudden you know the balance was such well I'll just go out and do this myself and, and sell them and make money I'd like did they ever say why the uh, the women just didn't say to the men no wait a minute you just take care of the family bring up the <laughs> I know how to do this I'll go out and make, make them and sell them <laughs> well, I don't understand why the guys. I, I don't understand that either. <laughs> you know, and I know the women knew better and wanted their children to turn out a certain way. <laughs> I'll make sure he knows the answer, the correct. Answer. Oh yeah, I saw. He I don't know right what away. that correct answer that. would be, but you know, it it was just the way of the men. The men did did the planting. Um, they didn't do the harvesting, but they did the planting. They carried the, the water. Hunting. They, the, hunting. the hunting and and there were and the building the building of the of their of the the, the villages and the homes so th it was very well ordered and you had your place and you had your your um responsibilities and um you know men men were weavers the men did weaving that was and they were silversmiths uh but pottery was just something they did not huh. uh was was more of a, of a woman it was the matriarch I can't believe the, that a seed. I mean, how did they get their how did they get their finger in there to work around that to get those final? I don't know, Claudia, but I've seen seeds. some of those that are like a quarter of an inch at the most opening. I I have no idea how they do this. Well, they what are, I would do is go from the top down. Yeah. <laughs> 
I would that, just that, you know what that that's ball. probably what they did is did they did the the bottom and then just put a little hole in it and then did the yeah. other bottom and then put them together in the middle yeah. i don't know patricia but that's a good thing i'm going to find out to see how they do those seed pots you know i'm going to see yeah, because it, the the top didn't come up it was just a little hole right right it was just a hole yeah. it, it was just and, a, and if the hole if it's a coil they probably did two, the whole two part pieces. and then put it yeah. in the middle mm -hmm. it's probably what sense. it'd be that makes sense that makes yeah. sense well lillian hold up your little your little storyteller doll again now that we've got a bigger square for you oh okay there she is <laughs> yeah. okay whoa whoa okay there we are where did you get that lil uh, Richard brought it from Santa Fe, but it was given to me because we had been made grandparents of twins. Uh -huh. And so that's what it, I always thought of it is the, uh -huh. the mother with the little twins. Mm -hmm. So sweet. But Claudia had me convinced this morning that it was from some famous <laughs> group. I, I said, no, this is a knockoff. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's lots of Jimenez. I don't know if that, is it Jimenez? Is that the yeah. name? Yeah. Are there many, many, and the names are there. I mean, the names are traditional. They carry them down. So that you're going to find lots of Garcias and Montoya's and oh, Martinez's yeah. and Youngblood. I mean, it just goes, I mean, dozens of families. And I didn't mention that. Um, I'm going to take you back because we forgot one, so. Oh, no, I was just going to, that was our last one to show. That was, oh, uh, no, you have one here. Oh, that's yeah, cool. there we go. The, that's the, uh, um, just some of the older the, young, the younger the newer generation the pottery the potters and it they're obviously all in the santa clara uh style it almost looks aztec you're mm -hmm. right it almost looks aztec or cling it uh uh alaska uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah right and you're yeah. right she was but she was born into the santa clara and then she moved to the pacific <coughs> west and oh. was it was inspired by them Oh, so I love the dragonflies. The dragonflies yeah. are, are wonderful, aren't they? Oh, they are. They, uh, you know, they, uh, um, they also are rebirth. They're also very water oriented. Where do you find dragonflies? Around water. So, um, uh, very much, um, very much into nature. They didn't do anything haphazard. It wasn't done on a fluke. It was done very thoughtful and mindful when they, when they did something. Wow. So, beautiful. Thank they are beautiful. Thank you so much, pieces. Suzanne. Oh, yes, thank you, Suzanne. You're That's welcome. gorgeous. I, I apologize for taking so much time. As you can say, I just like, blah, 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 blah. I just love this it's stuff. So interesting. <laughs> thank it you. went too fast. Oh, oh good. Thank, thank you, Lil. Really that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, compliment. Yeah, Thank great. You both. Thank you okay. both. Well, are we ready for our meditation? I'm going to have to leave. So. So. Thank you. I certainly am. What do you think of that? Oh. 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 Well, I was inspired, you know, by Suzanne's presentation and mm. this beautiful environment that these artists created their, their art in. So if you just want to breathe, I know every one of you is an experienced meditator, so I won't go through the steps. Just go ahead and take in a deep cleansing breath to the count of four or five and let your exhale go longer than your inhale. And I invite you in your mind's eye to meander down this path and find a cool, comfortable place to sit. Breathing in and breathing out. Maybe looking at the sky or maybe the redness, how the yellow moves to orange and then red. Or with the verdant green. I'm going to share a Navajo poem with you. It's called, In Beauty I Walk. 
with beauty before me, I walk. With beauty behind me, I walk. With beauty above me, I walk. With beauty around me, I walk. It has become beauty again. Today, I will walk out. Today, everything negative will leave me. I will be as I was before. I will be as I was created. I will have a light body. I will be filled with joy and nothing will hinder me now. I walk with beauty before me. I walk with beauty behind me. I walk with beauty below me. I walk with beauty above me. I walk with beauty around me. My words will be beautiful. In beauty all day long may I walk. The returning of the seasons may I walk. With dew about my feet may I walk. With beauty before me, may I walk. With beauty behind me, may I walk. With beauty above me, may I walk. With beauty around me, may I walk. In an old age, wandering on a trail of beauty, lively, may I walk. In an old age, wandering on a trail of beauty, living again, may I walk. My words will be beautiful. It is true, my friends, that we are created in God's image and likeness. Or just think about how amazing and how beautiful our true nature is. Thank you, Divine Presence. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, Suzanne. And with this lovely shared experience, I will bring us all back together. <laughs>